Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Monday, the 30th of June. You're tuned into our mid morning newscast here on Adirang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. North Korea launches two short range Scud missiles into the East Sea in an apparent show of force ahead of Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Seoul later this week. The Korean government will change scores of regulations and systems across a range of government departments. The changes, which cover everything from pensions to harsher punishment for child abusers, will take effect in the second half of the year. Plus, the Korean national team return home after being eliminated from the Brazil World Cup late last week. In Sunday's action, the Netherlands and Costa Rica advance to the quarterfinals. But our top story this morning, the South Korean military is on high alert after North Korea on Sunday launched two short-range Scud missiles into the East Sea. The firings are thought to be a show of force ahead of a visit by Chinese President Xi Jinping to the south later this week. Our Hwang sang -hee starts us off. North Korea fired two short-range missiles off its eastern coast early Sunday morning, the second such launch in less than a week. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the weapons fired were Scud missiles that flew about 500 kilometers from the vicinity of Wonsan into the East Sea. An official from the Joint Chiefs of Staff said North Korea did not give any prior warning of the launch for civilian flights or vessels. The South Korean military believes the missiles to be Scud C or Scud ER missiles. Scud missiles are liquid propellant ballistic missiles that have a range covering the entire Korean peninsula. North Korea has fired 11 short range missiles this year, and Sunday's launch marks its fourth ballistic missile launch. In February, it fired four ballistic missiles believed to be Scud B missiles, and in March, it launched two missiles presumed to be Scud C or Scud ER missiles into the East Sea. Experts say the latest launch is a military demonstration aimed at drawing the attention of the international community ahead of Chinese President Xi Jinping's upcoming visit to South Korea this Thursday. The South Korean military has heightened its vigilance and beefed up its military readiness against any additional provocations by Pyongyang. Hwang sang -hee, Arirang News. Now, President Park Geun-hye will likely name General Han Min-gu as the nation's new defence minister following his confirmation hearing on Sunday. The Defence Committee of the National Assembly agreed that General Han was qualified to serve as the nation's defence chief. At his confirmation hearing, Han vowed to install the country's indigenous missile defence system as soon as possible to counter any North Korean threats. He also said he would make clear to Pyongyang that they will never get any concessions through military provocations and threats. Other nominees for key government posts will undergo confirmation hearings in the coming weeks. Now, Chinese President Xi Jinping, who will be coming to Seoul later this week, has vowed that no violations of territorial integrity will be tolerated and he says no nation should be allowed to monopolize global affairs. Now watchers say his latest comments can be seen as a rather thinly veiled attack on the United States. Our Kim Min-ji reports. Chinese President Xi Jinping has stressed that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of a nation should be respected. His comments came during an event marking the 60th anniversary of a mutual peace agreement between China, Myanmar and India. The 1954 agreement called for mutually respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as mutual non-aggression and non-interference in domestic affairs. Sovereignty and territorial integrity should not be infringed upon. This is a basic principle that should not be ignored. The comments come as China is locked in territorial disputes with neighboring countries such as Japan, the Philippines and Vietnam. In a national meeting late last week, the leader said China should not forget its humiliating past as a victim of foreign aggression and called for stronger border defense. It was seen to target Tokyo in particular, which has been at odds with Beijing over territorial as well as historical disputes. He also stressed that China will not seek hegemony, no matter how strong it becomes. China does not acknowledge the notion that a country will seek hegemony when it grows in strength. Hegemony or militarism is not the genes of China. 
The Chinese leader also said the right of a country to choose its own social system and path of development should be respected. That remark was seemingly his way of telling the West to keep out of China's domestic affairs. The Chinese president, however, did not mention North Korea's nuclear weapons or the Korean Peninsula during his speech. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Korea will be the first Asian nation to be visited by Pope Francis. During his visit, which will run from August 14th to the 18th, the pontiff will attend a Catholic youth festival and preside over a ceremony to beatify 124 Korean Catholic martyrs. But he could do something even more significant because Dennis P. Halpin, who is a visiting scholar at the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, says he thinks the Pope could use his visit to stand in solidarity with Korea's surviving comfort women by arranging a meeting with them. He says that because the Pope will be here on August 15th, the holy day of obligation for the Roman Catholic Church, the feast of the Assumption of Mary into heaven and a date of symbolic ascendancy for all women, that he might meet with them. And it's also because it's Korea's Independence Day and this is, of course, when Korean women forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military were freed. Now, over in Japan, the Democratic, Liberal Democratic Party and the coalition partner, Komato, new Komato, appear set to approve a new draft statement saying that Japan must meet three conditions before exercising its right to collective self-defense, which is essentially the right to come to the military aid of an ally under attack. The first condition describes an attack on a nation with a very close relationship to Japan. The attack must pose a clear existential danger to Japan or undermine Japanese citizens' constitutional rights to life, liberty and happiness. The other two conditions restrict the military by saying there has to be no other way to protect the nation in question and its citizens and that the use of military action should be kept to a bare minimum. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been pushing to allow the country to exercise its right to collective self-defence and the cabinet could vote on the measure as early as Tuesday. Now, back here in Korea and the nation's political parties are gearing up for by-elections on July 30th, which will be crucial after a round of local elections earlier in June produced no clear winner or loser, really. And the ruling Senate party in the main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, will nominate candidates for 15 parliamentary seats that are up for grabs and both parties are planning to run with their political heavyweights for races in the capital, uh, Seoul, and also Gyeonggi-do province. But neither party has revealed the names of their candidates yet, possibly indicating that they're planning to wait to do so until just before the candidate registration deadline. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 50 billion Now, there are a number of changes afoot for Korea in the second half of the year. These cover everything from the basic pension system to social welfare and health care. Shin Semin gives us a rundown of some of the changes that are on the way. The government on Sunday issued a list of changes to 160 regulations and systems in 27 government departments. The list will be posted and distributed on central, local and municipal government websites starting Monday and the changes will take effect in the second half of the year. The changes cover pensions for the elderly, more leave for working moms and harsher punishments for child abusers. One of the changes is related to data collection and follows a series of major security breaches in recent months. The new rule bans public institutions and private enterprises from illegally collecting citizens' identification numbers. Institutions with security breaches will be fined up to 500,000 U.S. dollars, even if the data was collected legally. Another change has to do with the pension system. 
Elderly people over the age of 65 who are in the lower 70 percent income bracket will be granted a maximum basic pension of nearly 200 U.S. dollars a month starting in August. In the legal sector, starting in late September, child abusers will face stronger punishments. A child abuse victim will be isolated from his or her assailant, and for the first time, child abuse victims will be provided with legal counsel, previously only allowed for adult victims of sexual violence. Working women juggling home and work life who are the mothers of twins will be granted 30 extra days of maternity leave, giving them a four-month break. And in the agriculture sector, area of origin labeling for pork will be enforced to ensure safe distribution and improve epidemics prevention efforts. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. Now to some positive economic news, because Korea's job market seems to be faring pretty well. Job creation is expected to top half a million in 2014, marking the highest gain in 12 years. According to major economic think tanks, the nation will likely add between 400,000 to 480,000 new jobs in the second half of the year. Although the figure is a sharp decline from a year-on-year -year job growth of over 600,000 in the first half of this year, the job growth for the entire year is forecast to exceed the government's target of 450,000. It is expected to be the largest jump since 2002, when just under 600,000 new jobs were created. Now, it's an extremely difficult task. Making sure spent nuclear fuel is stored safely is a problem that is becoming particularly worrisome for Korea now, as storage facilities are, in fact, nearing a saturation point. And as our Paulie explains, time is running out to find a solution. When petroleum is burned, it releases carbon dioxide. But when coal briquettes are burned, you're left with ashes. Nuclear energy is similar to briquettes in this sense. When 100 kilograms of uranium is spent, the nuclear waste produced is almost equal in amount, and it comes with radioactivity and extreme heat. So the fuel is stored in a nearby cistern and cooled. The problem here in Korea is that some of these temporary facilities will be full to the brim in the next few years. These are the current levels at some plants. The Kodi nuclear plant in Pusan, the nation's oldest, stands at 70-70% capacity, Warsong at 75, Hanbit at 65, and Hanur at 62. Although the construction of new plants has given Korea some time to spare, experts say the deadline is 2024. Korea has a total of 23 nuclear plants and some 700 tons of spent fuel is produced each year. Without a solution in the next 10 years, the nuclear plants will have to be shut down and Korea will face a risk of a blackout. The construction of interim storage facilities is currently being considered as the most plausible solution. As there is a master plan to permanently dispose of or reprocess spent fuel, I believe a time frame needs to be clarified for the construction of interim storage facilities. Some 20 countries worldwide operate interim storage facilities. An independent committee was formed last year and is seeking advice and ideas from experts. They plan to decide on how to deal with the issue by the end of the year. Paul Yi, Adiyang News. Now, sales of imported cosmetics here in Korea are falling, but more affordable domestic brands are going in the other direction. And that's not only because of the economic downturn. Now, Son jung -in explains the other factors that are in play. Korean cosmetic brands have long been a favorite in overseas markets, but for some time, Koreans were far more interested in buying imported luxury brands. But the tide appears to be turning. Sales of imported cosmetics increased steadily from early 2000 until their peak in 2009 at 26% of the market share. However, in the time since, the figure has been on the decline, dropping to 23% last year. Domestic brands have been filling the gap, with the market share rising from 47% in 2008 to 57% last year. Market analysts attribute this turn events to several factors, one being the rise in dermatology clinics. 
Competition in the saturated market has prompted clinics to cut the cost of treatment procedures by as much as two-thirds. That means more people from all walks of life are visiting on a regular basis for their skin care needs, which is making them less reliant on cosmetics. And as such, customers have become smarter and choosier about which products they use on their faces. That's caused them to lean more on high-quality, low-priced products they can trust, namely Korean-made cosmetics. Popular brand stores like Innisfree, The Face Shop, and Misha have doubled their sales in recent years. Considering the increased number of people visiting dermatology clinics and the high quality that domestic skin brands provide, the latest trend is not expected to turn around anytime soon. Chun Jung In, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Monday morning. For that, we turn over to our Eunice Kim standing by the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Hello, Mark. Now, the search for survivors is still on in India. This after two buildings collapsed, one after the other, essentially, on Saturday. You're right, Mark. More than 100 people are still feared trapped at a construction site of an 11-story tower, including scores of workers believed to have been at the basement when it collapsed near Chennai, the capital of Tamil Nadu state. Now, at least five construction company officials were detained Sunday as part of a police investigation. And earlier in New Delhi, a rundown four-story building had topped over, killing 10 people, including two children. Officials suspect construction work at an adjoining building could be to blame there. Building collapses, unfortunately, are becoming a common occurrence in India, driven by high demand, a lack of construction codes, poor quality building materials and corruption. The Sunni militant group waging a blitz through northern Iraq has formally declared the creation of an Islamic caliphate. A spokesman for ISIL announced its name change to simply the Islamic State. In the audio file posted online, he also defined its territory as land running from northern Syria to Iraq's Diyala province and called on Muslims everywhere to swear allegiance to its declared leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Now, much of the region is already under militant control, and the announcement came on the first day of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan and as Iraqi forces fought to retake the northwestern Iraqi city of Tikrit that had fallen to militants nearly 20 days ago. The Baghdad government claimed victory, but some residents of Saddam Hussein's hometown said they saw no Iraqi troops. A series of churches were attacked and burned down on Sunday in Nigeria. Suspected Boko Haram militants stormed at least three churches, The Guardian reports, killing dozens of men, women and children near Chibok. Residents said about 20 men in a truck and motorcycles drove into town armed with bombs and guns. There is no definitive figure on the number of casualties. A state of emergency, though, is in place in northern Nigeria following near daily raids by suspected Boko Haram militants. They have killed hundreds in recent months in the name of creating an Islamic state. And finally, U.S. President Barack Obama will seek some $2 billion in emergency funds to address a noted surge in illegal child migration from Central America. More than 52,000 unaccompanied children entering the U.S. have been taken into custody since October, striking what's being called an urgent humanitarian situation. The White House says it will make the request in a letter to Congress on this Monday. Obama will also ask for legal authorities to apply fast-track deportation procedures and apply stiffer penalties to those who smuggle children across the border. And a good Monday morning to you all as we kick things off with the South Korean national football team as the Taeguk Warriors return to Korea after their World Cup in Brazil. And their return was welcomed with a mixed response as an unruly person threw a taffy at the players while others shouted that it's okay. 
Midfielder Son Heung-min stated that they were unprepared for the World Cup, while Koo ja -chul was more optimistic, stating that it was an experience to be learned. Meanwhile, manager Hong Myung-bo added that he will decide on his future shortly, as many speculate that he will resign as the head coach. And let's continue on with our 2014 Brazil World Cup action, starting off with an exciting match which took place earlier today. The Netherlands taking on Mexico. Let's take a look at the highlights. They started out rather slow with both sides scoreless after the first half, but Giovanni Dos Santos scores the first goal of the match, giving Mexico the 1-0 lead. Now Mexico had it in the bag, but Wesley Snyder in the 88th minute finds the back of the net for the equalizer. Now the match looked like it was going into extra time, but a penalty is called in the dying seconds of the match as Hundelar scores the game winner, helping the Netherlands advance to the quarterfinals with a 2-1 win. Meanwhile, with Greece taking on Costa Rica, scoreless first half, but Brian Ruiz in the 52nd minute gives Costa Rica the 1-0 lead. Now both sides looking quite defensive the rest of the way, but another last-minute equalizer, this time by Socrates Papastolopoulos. And as the match goes into the penalty shootout, Costa Rica goes perfect on the spot kick, beating the Greek side 5-3 to advance to the next round. And now let's take a look at the exciting finishes from the previous day, including Brazil and Chile, who both fought hard till the end. Now taking a look at the scores here, a couple of first half goals had both sides tied at one apiece, and even after the extra time, no winner. But some dramatic penalty as several key missed spot kicks led to Neymar, scoring the deciding kick as the host nation advanced with a 3-2 penalty victory. Meanwhile, Uruguay without Luis Suarez didn't look threatening at all as Colombia's James Rodriguez scores twice in this match, helping Colombia win it 2-0. And now finishing things off, we continue on with our ever so controversial biting incident of Luis Suarez, who's been, of course, suspended for his actions against Giorgio Chiellini last week. Because now, according to a new report, it might not have been his third offense, but his eighth. According to the England's Daily Star, Luis Suarez, during his youth football days, bit five other players on the pitch. So of course, when he was just 14 years of age. Now, the report added that those previous incidents were also reported to FIFA and that the four-month ban was not enough to punish the star. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee ji -hyun with your weather update. Uh, it seems like the last day of June will be another hot and humid day. Temperatures will continue to be on the warm side. Highs will be rising to 30 degrees Celsius across the region. So the weather pattern should be similar to what we had last couple of days. But sudden showers are expected in the eastern parts of the peninsula. Somewhere between 5 to 40 millimeters of precipitation is expected in in these regions, along with thunder, lightning, and even hail, uh, can be ruled out during the day. And at top temperatures will be hovering over 30 degrees Celsius throughout the week here in Seoul. While soupy condition is in store this week in Seoul, um, the southern regions and Jeju will be affected by monsoon rain from. Wednesday. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The high in the capital and Daegu will rise to 30, while Gwangju will soar to 31, and Busan should make it to 27 later in the afternoon. Now, for other regions, down on Jeju and Daegu should see a high of 27 and 30. Dukdo will reach 22, while Mount Kungang hikes up to 18. Well, that's all for me at this hour, and hope you have a wonderful day.
Okay, well, that's all we have for now. We'll be back for our next newscast at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.